Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Shepard. I will be your teaching instructor for this course. Um, I'm one of two teaching instructors. Um, a little bit about myself. So if you're if you're watching this, I'll be your TA. I am currently on deployment with the National Guard. I'm in Puerto Rico working on hurricane preparedness, so I won't be as responsive um, to emails. So if you need quick responses about the logistics of the class, I would recommend um, emailing the other TA. And if she can't facilitate your questions, obviously uh, email the professors. Um, my name is Mark Shepard. My email is mshepard, S-H-E-P-P-A-R-D at gradcenter.cuny.edu. Um, I'll get to your emails uh, as possible. Um, I don't quite know exactly where I'll be on the island or how much access I'll have to the internet, um, but I will respond as uh, as I can. Um, I'll be back in about March, um, and from that point forward, we'll sort of conduct um, uh, we'll conduct re recitation classes uh, in person. Okay. Now, without further ado, that's uh, that's me. Oh, a little bit else about me. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the Graduate Center. My research interests are mostly in inequality, econometrics, um, wealth inequality, income inequality, that kind of stuff. So you guys are interested in that. Um, also, feel free to reach out. Uh, without further ado, let's open up um, the lecture. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go through um, the prepared materials and give sort of a different spin on um, the materials that Professor Shankar has uh, generously provided for us. This is all on Top Hat. If you guys aren't familiar with Top Hat, it is um, sort of the platform that uh, the professor is using to sort of facilitate the class. So if you're unfamiliar, uh, please familiarize yourself with that because that's where all the homeworks will be. Um, lectures will be posted, videos will, will be posted. Um, most things will be sort of facilitated through uh, that uh, that platform. Okay, so this is introductory introduction to um, economic analysis. <clears throat> Again, uh, watch, uh, complete the reading assignment. Uh, it's on top hat and sort of watch the videos. Um, so economics, has kind of a few running definitions, um, sort of depending on who you ask. Um, but one of the standard kind of go-to baseline definitions is that it's the study of how individuals and or societies uh, use kind of limited or scarce resources to satisfy unlimited wants, right? We all have infinite things that we want and we're trying to maximize our utility, what makes us happy, um, but we only have so much time, so much money, uh, so there's only so much to go around either as individuals or as a collective. Um, and economics is sort of the study of like, how, how do we do this? <clears throat> um, a scarce good or an economic good is a good whose demand exceeds supply, even at zero price. Um, in contrast, a free good is one where supply exceeds demand at a zero price. So all goods are scarce. Almost all goods are scarce. Um, everything has some sort of binding constraint to how much of it there is. Um, inversely, if we could, we would all want an infinite amount of that thing, um, regardless of, of what it is. If we could all have all of it, then we, we probably would. Um, that captures our demand. Um, okay. This in lies like the the kind of ultimate problem of what we call homo economicus. Um, this term is sort of like a, a play on words uh, from homo sapien or homo erectus. Um, it's the study of man through the lens of economics. We start with this baseline that resources are scarce, budgets are scarce, time is scarce, all of that. Also, we have unlimited demand for things. We all want more and more and more. And how do how does this sort of economic man kind of navigate those challenges? How do they maximize utility given limited resources? 
Um, and because time is a resource, everything is, you know, everything is scarce. There's always trade-offs. We're always trying to evaluate, well, if I do this, then I can't do that. And if I do that, then I can't do this. Um, there's always, there's always like a basic trade-offs. Um, as individuals, we tend to get uh, the kind of best individual outcome if we are sort of like mixing um, our wants uh, relative to our uh, limited resources. Um, is there anything more I want to say about homo economicus? Um, homo economicus is also, there's a few ways to kind of describe this. Sometimes um, this is called like uh, serum, S-I-R-U-M, the self-interested rational utility maximizer. Um, that it's someone who is, they make their decisions based on self-interest. They want to maximize their own utility, the thing that makes them feel good. Uh, and they're doing it rationally, right? They, they've, they're they able to look at all of the decisions and they're choosing the best one, the one that makes them the happiest, that makes them the most money, that whatever, right? So um, one way to kind of make homo economic, economicus uh, into like a another term is to think of it as serum, S-I-R-U-M, the self-interested rational utility maximizer. Um, <clears throat> So rationality makes is is a big a big component. Um, so they're rational decision makers. They're able to make comparisons of economic costs and economic benefits uh, relative to all available alternatives, and they're going to choose the best one, the one that minimizes costs and maximizes benefits. Um, in doing so, they're sort of asking themselves. Um, you know, how do I maximize time? How do I save the most on rent? You know, how do I kind of smooth my consumption in the in the future or or kind of land the best employment opportunities, those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> at a firm level, the way that this kind of translates up is firms are asking themselves, you know, how can we sell this at a lower price? How can we make more money? Um, how do we invest more properly? How do we <clears throat> increase government benefits, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you don't have to think of rationality as being bounded by scale. It's not something that only individuals can do. Um, it scales all the way up. And this sort of like uh, microeconomic style of thinking applies to individuals, to firms, even to countries. If you scale all the way up in comparison to other countries, the way that each country will operate relative to each other will be sort of very um, like, foundationally rooted in this kind of microeconomic thinking. Let's go to module two. Okay, so this is part two of module one. So two common fallacies in, de in decision-making. One, you have explicit cost bias. There's a tendency to only count explicit cost uh, expenses for which uh, there has been an actual transaction while ignoring hidden or implicit costs. This is like saying, they were only worried about the, the ticket price. What we see on the sticker, that's all that we take into account. And that's a fallacy, right? There's other things that go into that. There's how long did it take me, you know, even if you're buying the same thing from, you know, if you're going to buy eggs from this bodega and not that bodega, maybe one of them is further away than the other one. So if you're only concerned about the sticker price of the eggs or the milk or whatever, you're sort of like leaving out um that one is across town or or whatever. Um, when we maximize, when we are fully rational, we're kind of taking into account all of the alternatives, all of the, the cost associated with the transaction that aren't captured in the transaction itself. So if it if it's a further walk, if it's more stressful, um, if it's it just takes more time, longer commute, anything, those are all implicit costs that you should sort of factor in. To your thinking making. Another big one is the sunk cost fallacy. It's a tendency to make decisions based on things that have already happened, expenses that you've already expensed. Um, so an easy way to kind of analogize this is to think about anything that you've invested a lot of time into, whether it's like a, a video game or a, a relationship or whatever, and you're making your decisions on going forward based on like what's already happened. Um, you know, I've, I've played 
this video game for this many hours. So I can't walk away now or, um, you know, I've been with this person for so long, whatever it is. If you're making your decisions based on something that's already taken place and not based on future projected kind of value, um, that's a sunk cost fallacy. You're, you're thinking in the past, a cost that you can never redeem. So it, it can't or it shouldn't um, kind of factor into your, your rational decision making going forward. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of implicit cost. One of the biggest uh, implicit costs is what's called opportunity cost. The cost of the opportunity that you forego. Um, so this is like the this or that. Just because you came to school today, because you're watching this lecture, you could be doing something else. You could be making food for yourself. You could be um, going to the park. There's lots of things that you could be doing with your time. So what you choose to do with your time should be the most valuable thing of given all of your options, right? Um, but just because you choose the thing that's most valuable doesn't mean that the other things aren't valuable. Watching a video lecture is valuable, but going to the park is also valuable. There's value in the sunshine and going outside and fresh air and that sort of stuff. Um, so when you make your decisions, you have to make your decisions with respect to an appreciation for the, the value of your the other alternatives. The value of those other alternatives, that's called an opportunity cost. The value of the next best alternative uh, to the choice being evaluated. Um, the opportunity cost is the explicit cost plus the implicit cost. The explicit cost is an accounting cost. Um, so if you are an accounting major, if you're doing your tabulation of like in you know, like you know, income to liabilities, liabilities would be the explicit cost. Economics kind of broadens this and says there's more to the transaction than, than what's actually captured in the price. There's also the value of the things we forego. Um, that's an implicit cost. The imputed value of owned resources. Um, let's skip this example. It's a good example. It's just uh, for time's sake. Uh, so ignoring some cost. Um, so just to reiterate, um, some costs are costs that have already been incurred and do not change with the choice being selected. Um, let's do some rational choice. Right. So in this example, you can see that Professor Shankar has um, kind of laid out whether to buy equipment or not buy equipment. Those are our two choices. And we're trying to make the most rational decision. And we have the benefits of what we can sort of we've calculated the benefits 350 380 but there's also opportunity costs which are the inverse right 380 and 350 um and then there's sunk cost she's crossed this out because she's explicitly saying you should not factor in your sunk cost into your decision making and so then you just do the arithmetic 350 minus 380 you just go horizontally 350 minus 380 gives you negative 30 right inversely um to not buy the equipment as a benefit of 380 uh, plus 350 of the opportunity cost gives you a net of positive 30. So in this decision, whichever one has the greater surplus is the one that you should be choosing. We choose to not buy the equipment. Okay, and that's the first lecture.